And so welcome everybody to Computation Today. Uh, of course, every week we, we kind of deal with a wide variety of areas. Um, and this week we're very excited about our, our speaker. Uh, and Kirsten also, one of our students who it was her idea, she said, hey, this is a guy we need to talk to. So I'm glad that she spoke up. Um, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, David Tibio uh, was born and raised in Maine, as you just said, uh, spending a few years in South Portland. Um, but of course, he is a survivor of the tragedy that unfolded at Mount Carmel in Waco, Texas, 27 years ago. In February of uh, 1993, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms raided David Koresh's Branch Davidian home, a small religious community triggering a drawn-out gun battle that resulted in the loss of many lives. After a 51-day standoff, the conflict ends when an FBI assault leads to a fire that engulfed the Branch Davidian home, killing 76 people, most of which were David's friends and people he considered family. A Place Called Waco, Survivor's Story, is a book that David wrote in 1999 about his experience at Mount Carmel. Uh, David's book was noticed and was made into a Paramount Network six-part miniseries about the events that took place between February 28th and April 19th of the year 1993. This six-part scripted series called Waco dramatizes one of the most misunderstood, uh, misunderstood stories in American history. David's been all over. He's lived in LA, Austin, Waco, Maine. He enjoys playing drums and has been in many bands, including Why, I, Why Am I, Lefty, Matt <laughs> Sally, Dakota, uh, Dakota, Sideways, and The Blast Addicts. He also recorded two original CDs, uh, one of which was with the band Lefty and the other with the Blast Addicts. He continues to spread the shocking truth about what happened at Mount Carmel. Um, and I've noticed online that you are all over the place, podcasts, documentaries, TV shows. Um, and one thing I would just share about my short personal interaction with David, extremely kind, engaging, and really, really passionate about what he's doing. So David, it's, real, it's a real honor to host you today and to have you share with us so, uh, brother, the floor is yours. Well, I wish all my introductions were that were that well done. Thank you so much. I may have you write the uh, my bio. Actually, that was amazing. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So, what I've been doing is be. <clears throat> I love podcasts. By the way, I don't know if any of you are podcasters or out there listening to podcasts all the time, but I think podcasts are changing are going to change the world, if not the country. At least the way that we discuss things, listen to people, hear what they have to say. And in, a, in essence, do away with a soundbite, which I think does not serve any of us very well. You can't really tell what someone's been through, who they are from a 30 second clip. And that's been a big problem with media and how the media presents things, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, religious communities, um, um, uh, per, per, people personally being attacked, bullying. There's so many things that we can look at where, you know, the media has such a, a negative role. They play such a negative role and they have for a very long time. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get too far into this, but one of the things that really bothers me is the fact that all of, all of the media outlets in the United States of America are controlled by four corporations. It used to be five, now it's four. So four companies control every newspaper, every magazine, everything you see on television. And that's 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 pretty frightening. And uh, one of the things I learned about this country was uh, was when I went overseas, I learned more about America than I had being here. And that was after Waco. Now, after Waco occurred, uh, the attacks were not, it was incessant, it's just on and on and on. It was it was cult, cult this, cult that. Uh, there's that freaky guy from that from that weird group. David Koresh was this terrible, horrible person. He had horns. He did all these terrible things to people. And, you know, I, I'm listening to all of this and taking all of this in during the siege, after the siege. And, you know, I'll get, I'll get back to a more of a cr uh, chronology of the story in just a second. But I'm listening to all this, and, I, and I'm saying to myself, you know, those aren't the people that I knew. David, that's how they're describing David is not the guy that I knew. And not just David, the people that were there. Now, the people that were there were 100% sincere. They had studied the scripture. Um, I'd say about a third, uh, three quarters of the people there had 
were, were, were going to seminary school. They were studying to be preachers and teachers. So they were furthering their education. They weren't just a bunch of sheep looking for someone to follow. And that's the impression you get when you think of Waco. And when you think of anyone that, you know, is looking for spiritual enlightenment and they follow a person, a guru. You know, you always have to point back to, you know, the fact that, well, Christ had 12 apostles. Who were they? You know, these are all people following someone. Uh, a lot of people want to talk about brainwashing and they want to talk about, um, I, I had an email just yesterday about how, how, how could David Crush control all those people in such a short time and bring about what he did. And I say, you ever been in the military? You know, they shave your head, they rip you down mentally. And when they tap you on the shoulder, you're going to jump out of the plane because you're conditioned to, when you're tapped on the shoulder to jump out of the plane. And that's the American military. That's anything. There's a certain amount of conditioning. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's get back to, let's just, I'm going to start from the beginning. And what I don't want to do is talk too much because I want to have time to open it for questions. So if you can cut me off, so we have time for at least, you know, five or six questions. I find that to be, we get the most out of the, I find you, you we all get the most out of the questions. So I'm kind of looking forward to getting there, but let's start at the beginning. So I was a drummer. I was living in Hollywood. I went to Musicians Institute and Everything about my path <clears throat> led me to meeting David Crush and Steve Schneider. Let me explain. I knew growing up that I wanted to be in Los Angeles, that I wanted to be a drummer in a band. That's what I wanted. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to be an entertainer. I just wanted to play with, with a group of guys and hopefully tour the world and have a great time. <clears throat> so I moved to LA. I went to music school back in, oh boy, 89, the two years after I graduated from high school. I went to music school, I did the course, I was playing around with bands, nothing was happening for me. I was working at the Man's Chinese Theater, the place where all the stars put their handprints and their footprints in the, in the cement, and then you can go see them, that's Man's Chinese Theater. I was working there, <laughs> oh boy, I was working there in the, uh, in the souvenir, souvenir department in the, where they sell trinkets and stuff. I had the stupid red smock on that I was supposed to wear. And I'm just like, you know, waiting on tourists all day long, you know. And I, I looked out to the sky one day and I said, God, and the moral of this story is about to be prepared. Uh, <clears throat> be careful what you ask the universe for and what you ask God for. I said, God, can you please introduce me to the people I'm, I'm supposed to meet here? I'm thinking in the back of my head, where's my Robert Plant? Where's, where's my Led Zeppelin? Where, where are the guys that are going to help me fulfill my dreams? That's what I'm thinking in my head. But I said, God, can you please introduce me to the people I am supposed to meet here? A couple of days later, I go into the guitar center and we're late for rehearsal. I shouldn't even have been there. My singer broke a drumstick on the dashboard. I made them stop. We were late for a rehearsal. At that time, you had to pay for practice space. I went in, I got a pair of drumsticks and instead of going right back to the car, I went into the electronic drum room. <clears throat> I saw these two guys looking at a kit and they said, you were a drummer? I had drumsticks in my hand. I said, yeah, I guess so. They asked me if I'd play, I played. Played for just a couple, about a half a minute to a minute. Just, you know, went around the kit. They said, wow, you're really good. Uh, we're looking, you know, for a drummer. Uh, are you interested? And uh, there's a scruffy guy in a t-shirt and, and ripped jeans. And then there's this other guy who's very well-dressed, well-mannered, groomed, uh, excellent speaker. That was Steve Schneider. He goes, I'm Steve Schneider. This is David, David Koresh. We're, uh, you know, we, uh, we're from Texas. We live out here, we're looking for a drummer. And if you're interested, give us a call and they hand me a card. And I looked at the card that said Cyrus Productions on the front and on the back, it had all this religious scripture. I said, oh, you guys Christian? And I handed the card back. I'm not really interested in being in a Christian band, I told them at the time. You know, and I wasn't. A little background, I was baptized Catholic. But if you know anything about being Catholic, it'd say 100,000 Hail Marys, no matter what you do, you're fine. Uh, my grandmother made me say my prayers every night. And then I went to Sunday school and learned about some guy in a whale who got thrown up at later on the beach. Adam and Eve came, from, you know, uh, women came from a man's rib, all, you know, all these tales, of the scriptures. And I'm just like, hmm, this is real? Well, yeah, I guess I believed in Santa Claus too at one time. Uh, my point is, then I used to then I used to watch the Sunday preachers and I used to watch the TV preachers and I could just tell they were all about money. And I'm thinking to myself, these people don't care about my salvation. They, they want my money. I didn't I couldn't understand why people would send them money. <clears throat> anyway, 
I knew there was something to the Bible because the Bible has been here for thousands of years. Many people have put their lives on the line for it, their faith on the line. Many people have died for it. Many people have lived by it. There's a power to the book. There's a power to the scripture. And I wanted to know truly what that was. <clears throat> but I knew when I read it myself, I did not understand it at all. You ever read Ezekiel or some stuff in Isaiah? Oh, my God. Ezekiel's made off some guy's acid trip, I swear to God. That is the weirdest, strangest book ever. And how do you make sense of that? It was above me, I can tell you that. <clears throat> but I, you know, I figured there was some wisdom out there about it. Maybe I'd run into it someday. So there I am in Guitar Center. I hand the card back and Steve says, listen, we're not exactly Christian and probably more Jewish, but we're not exactly Jewish. He said, we've been, <clears throat> I've been all over the world with this guy. We, he just, you know, we're looking for a drummer. We want to start a band, but we know something about the scripture. It's something called the seven seals. It's all in there. He goes, we don't, we want to know Genesis to Revelation, what it really says, what it really means. If there's a word we're in question. We're going to look up the Hebrew. We really study the script. We really want to know what it says. And it, that kind of impressed me. Had he said, well, we just believe in Jesus and we can bring you to the enlightenment. Yeah, I probably would have been gone, frankly. Um, I went to a music school that on the very same block of the music school was the Scientology building. So every day I passed the Scientology building and some guy in a bow tie would be like, hey, would you like a free personality test? And we'd always figure out new fresh comebacks for this guy because he just he was just so fake. And well, you know, it was, it was the Scientology building. So you see all these same people dressed the same going in and out. You know, we thought it was a little odd. So anyway, what happened was I ended up taking the card and I called them a few days later. Things weren't working out as well as I had wanted them to. Uh, the guys in my band just wanted to sit around and get high. And I wanted to go out and promote the band. I wanted to, I, wa I was a serious, I wanted to be a serious musician. I wanted a career. So I called Dave and Steve. <clears throat> they came over. Steve came over one night and we had a study. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. Steve opened his book, his Bible. And he had one of those one inch margin Bibles where you can make all the notes. Every single page was filled with notes. Every page, every indentation. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't a blank space in his book. Not only was it filled with notes, it was color-coded. And so the first scripture he went through was something that we call the, the kingdom to be set up study, the kingdom study. That's where uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joseph, um, <laughs> Jeremiah, Revelation, just about every prophet talks about the kingdom of God that will be set up in Israel. Mount Zion is supposed to be raised above all other mountain ranges. God will live and dwell in Mount Zion and walls of fire, it says. That's where all the fire stuff comes in. The people always say, oh, they expected a fire. It was not that at all. It was all scriptural. So what David basically believed is that he was the seventh angel's message. And we're going to talk a little about Mount Carmel, which is really fascinating that he was the seventh angel's message and that his message was the seven seals and he could reveal it. And his, he, he was to show what was going to happen before the kingdom of God is set up. He did not believe that <clears throat> we were all, that it was a ranch apocalypse and that this was the end of the world. He believed that this was the beginning of the kingdom to be set up. Now, what was fascinating, uh, make a long story short, I got to know these guys over a few months had a few studies. It was interesting. I wasn't in. Okay. I mean, yeah, okay. The scripture can go anywhere there. Then they asked me to go to a place called Waco. Uh, uh, and David said that he was having people, people from all over the world would be coming for what he called. Uh, it was, it was the, the, they kept the, the festivals of the scripture. So they kept the festival, the, 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 the atonement and the Passover or the weeks or of God that David kept. So I, I think it was Passover when we first went to Mount Carmel. And he said, there'll be people coming from all over the world. When we get there, there'll be 30 people there. By the time it's, by the time everyone's there for the, for the actual studies, it'll go on for about two weeks. There'll be 130, 140. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll check it out. So we went, started getting studies from David. People started showing up. I started asking people, why are you here? A lot of them were black people from England. And I'm like, you know, whole families were coming. And all of these people were going to seminary school. And they said, David Kresh came to our school and he showed us more about the scripture in one night than we had learned our years of studying at seminary. 
So we left. We're, we're here. We want to learn the truth from this guy. I heard that story over and over and over and over again, all from people who were, who were at the college level. I was not at the college level. I was, you know, I was a, a, a lowly musician looking to have a good time. I was not looking for God, but I, I felt like it found me, if you will. So then he gave the, he gave us, he started his two week study on everything on the, on the seven seals. And what he did is on the very first night, he held the Bible up and he said, this is a Bible. It's two pieces of cow leather with a bunch of pages in between. And he goes, people spend their lives trying to figure this out. And he puts it up to his forehead and he goes, I see it panoramically as if it's happening before me from Genesis to Revelation, as if it's happening before me right now. And I said, whatever, dude, sure. That was my attitude. And within just a couple of days, a couple of studies, not even the two weeks, within a couple of days, I, I came to believe that he did see it panoramically. He knew what, what it was. He was able to go from one uh, prophet to another to another, show you whole chapters, how they correlate and relate to each other in a way that it brought everything to life. The Bible came to life. It made sense to me for the first time in my life. That's the best way I can describe it. It's the, it's, it's the simplest and most honest. Um, people all the time want me to give them studies. I don't do it. I don't do that. I don't, I don't even open the Bible. It terrifies me. I'll be honest with you. I find the Bible to be a very scary book. Um, if it's true, then what we are to face are some, some very, very hard times. And, and if it isn't, then, then why are we here? Why are we doing all this? Why are we going all this? Why does, why does uh, Rob have a collar on? You know, there's, there's just a power. I, it, it I talk to atheists all day long. And I'm just like, what's it like to not believe in anything? I just don't understand that. I feel like I'm always on a path. And I feel like even meeting David Koresh and Steve Schneider was a path. And when I look back at everything, people often say, don't you wish that you wouldn't have gone through that? And I, I, I'll say, no, I had no choice. <laughs> that being there at Mount Carmel was, was part of my destiny. It's not over yet, but it was definitely, I, I had to go through that experience. And I, I don't, Really know how to explain that to people. Uh, what I usually tell people is that I wouldn't sell my experience for all the money in the world, but I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy either. So that said, I'm going to tell you about the thing that really fascinated me about Mount Carmel. As I started to talk to the older people, I started to realize that Mount Carmel was a community that had been there for like 50 years. This was nothing new. David Kresh wasn't new. It started with a guy named Victor Howdeth. Victor Howdeth, people believed he branched, well, Victor Howdeth branched off from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, starting the Branch Davidians. He believed the Seventh-day Adventist Church was becoming too worldly. They weren't scriptural enough. They weren't in the book. They weren't devoted enough. So his group believed that he was inspired, that he was a modern-day prophet. Then when he died, Ben Roden took over, and he had, this, he had a new light. He was teaching something different but laying off the foundation of Victor Howdoff. Then when he died, his wife took over Lois. And the way that you take over at Mount Carmel is you have to have new insight to the scripture. You can't just say, God has chosen me to be your leader. You have to prove it out of the book. And a lot of people who come to Mount Carmel now trying to be the next David Koresh, they don't get this at all. It's very interesting. So Lois Roden started teaching the Holy Spirit feminine, and she would take Proverbs 8 and 9 and show where the feminine aspect of God is speaking to mankind. And so she, that was her new light. And everyone there was like, oh, my God, we've never seen this before. And yet they devoted their lives to the scripture, how they never see it. So that's, to me, one of the interesting things about the chronology of Mount Carmel is it's always someone who's claiming to have divine inspiration, what they call inspiration, all the way from Ellen G. White through. Then David Vernon Howell comes onto the scene. He starts working for uh, Lois. He starts serving Lois, basically. He wanted to be in a place where there was real prophets, where he could have a real connection to God. So they say about Vernon when he was young is that his brother, his stepbrother said he would leave for, for work and Vernon would be at the table reading either Ellen G. White or the Bible. And he would come back and Vernon would be in the same spot still reading. He, he was that devoted. He just spent his time learning the scripture. That's, that's what he did. So he took over when he went to Israel and came back with a vision. He said he had a vision. God showed him the seven seals and he started to reveal it to the people. And Lois said, looks like God has raised one up. 
And that's when there was a split. Half of the people, well, more than half went with David and believed that David was the next guy to, to have inspiration and to move on to the group. And the other half went with a guy named George Roden, who was Lois's son. And a lot of people thought that George should have been the next prophet because he was the son of two former prophets, Ben and Lois. This, I, I can't get into the whole, the history is fascinating and a little frightening, actually. It ended up in a, a gun battle, if you can believe that, between David Kresh and George Roden for who was going to control Mount Carmel. The cops came out. Everyone went to jail. Um, there was a trial. George Roden threatened the judge saying that, that if he didn't find in the favor of, of him, that God was going to give him herpes and AIDS. And so the judge threw him in jail and David ended up with the property. Very, very colorful story, story. I'll tell you that for sure. So Dave ends up with the property. He goes on. I was only in the group for like two years. I met David in Hollywood after all this had happened, right? But I start, you know, some piecing some things together and seeing that, okay, this guy here is running the show. And there's a lot of single women here that have kids. How is that? What's going on there? And so as he started to progress, the seals to me, the first seal, the marriage of the lamb, the second seal, man on the white horse, white horse, red horse, pale horse, all those are links to seals. And what David would do is he would take revelation and he would show the four horsemen and they would go back and show where those four horsemen were specifically in the prophets. So red horsemen, I think in Isaiah, but it's been a long time scripturally um he would go and show all the scriptures that talk about the red horse and what that actually meant okay one of the uh one of the horsemen has a a balance in his hand he is the deceiver he loveth to deceive so apparently this is a person of god in found in the, in the revelation that is going to be a deceiver that is going to lie to people that is going to well how is that an aspect of christ that doesn't sound like christ that sounds more like the antichrist right Anyway, uh, David could put it all together and, and make it make sense. So <clears throat> uh, a bunch of followers <clears throat> left him at the point <clears throat> that he had what he called this new light. And he had said all along that, you know, this, the married guys that come into the group are all married. And, the, you know, this, too bad the single guys aren't, aren't married because, you know, it's like we're coming to a time. <clears throat> that is the time of the end. I think everything is going to be escalated. And it's best if you don't marry. It's best if you are not joined with someone because you may have to face the world alone. Or you may go to jail for this truth. You may have to put your life on the line for this truth. So all these things <clears throat> became an aspect of everyday life. And at the point that David said that the married men are no longer married, <clears throat> that's when a lot of people left as you could probably tell that would definitely be a thing that would turn a lot of people off and make a lot of people not want to follow this, the, the, this guy that's, you know, th claims that he, <clears throat> excuse me, is the seventh angel's messenger, which means that he is the person with inspiration on the earth. Okay. To give God's truth. So a lot of people did leave. And some of those people like Mark bro, um, try to get the authorities involved because of all of David's wives. And in some of the cases, David's wives, like in, in Michelle's case, uh, she was 14 years old when she had serenity, uh, her first child with David. Now, you might say that right there, that's that's grounds for, you know, for jail and for removal. And yes, it should have been. But the problem was under Texas law, a 14 year old can marry with parental consent at the time which David had because uh, Michelle's parents believed that David was divinely inspired. Therefore, it was fine for Michelle to have a, a child with David. So <clears throat> you're coming into this group dynamic. When I met Michelle, she was um, 17. But when I, I did not know that. When I talked to Michelle, she acted more mature than any of the 23, 24 year old girls that I knew living in Hollywood, that, that was my age at the time was 23. So I never even gave a thought to how young Michelle was. It didn't occur to me because she seemed to be my, my peer, my equal. I did not look at her as a teenager because she did not act like a teenager. And it wasn't until I was doing the research for the book where I found out how old she actually was when she had conceived Serenity and I found it quite shocking. And it was very hard to talk about 
but I actually hired a co-writer to help me write about it because it was so shocking to me. I was raised in Maine with a very, very feminist liberal mother. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine these things, everything I was raised to believe in was direct opposite of what <clears throat> this religious community was. But when you look at it scripturally, it was all there and it all fit together. I see here. I, this is interesting to me because I, I'm you guys are. This is a religious. Well, I the school. You guys are studying things of Christianity, things of God. That's very interesting to me, especially in this day and age. So it's kind of like I'm used to talking to very secular audiences and having to hit them with some of these concepts is really. It's kind of a bizarre thing. Anyway, so because of people like Mark Bro and other people that had left under the new light, um, the pressure started to kind of be amped up, if you will, all right? Um, helicopters started flying around the building. And what we did, people often say, what did you, what was it like there? Well, we woke up in the morning, you know, the guys were on the first floor, the women were on the second floor. We woke up in the morning, we had something called either Oatmeal bananas or millet. Have you ever heard of millet? Millet's a oh, terrible grain. I really don't like millet. I'm sorry. I never did. Millet is a great, it's a scriptural grain. And they used to love it at Mount Carmel. And I used to just not like it at all. But it's similar to like an oatmeal type of thing. So they'd have millet in the morning and then, and, you know, bananas and whatever. But then we'd go out and we'd work on the property. We started to build the property. We'd break for lunch go back, work on the property some more, building that big building that you saw. When I first came there, there were 10 little houses lining the road that went down Mount Carmel. It was an eyesore to me. as the cultiest thing I've ever seen with those 10 houses. And I'm just like, what did I get into here? I had long hair. I was thin. That was fun. I had long hair. I was coming from Hollywood. There were deer passing in front of the bus. And I'm like, what have I gotten myself into coming here to Waco? And there was nothing. It was completely flat. And then I see these 10 little culty houses. I'm like, oh my God, what is going on here? What did I do to myself? <laughs> well, over the course of time, I, you know, I adopted the teachings. The teachings were fascinating. That, that's all I can say. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. I never expected that my life would be about the Bible. I never expected that for two years of my life, I would be immersed so deeply in the scripture that nothing else mattered. That even I would have for I would have given up playing drums for God at that point. And it was just because what I was learning was fascinating and it was continuing on and it went on and on. I kept learning, I kept learning. So I, I don't get a little out of myself. We know that we're being watched. There's helicopters flying back and forth. These guys move across the street. They all have, they're all in their mid thirties. How much time do we have, by the way? We have about 20 more minutes. All right, I'm gonna, I think I know what I'm going to do. Okay. So they, they move across the street. They're all in their mid thirties. They got Serengeti sunglasses. They have very nice SUVs. And they're claiming that they're going to TSTC to go to school. TSTC is the technical trade college in Waco where you learn how to do woodworking or you learn how to work with metal or, or weld, things like that. That's, you know, not exactly your academic place to go to school. And this guy is claiming that I said, well, what are you studying over there, TSTC, Robert? He said, and it was Robert. And he said, uh, I'm studying um, philosophy. And I said, you're studying philosophy, huh? Now, to be fair to Robert Rodriguez, he had said in an interview that he told me he was studying photography. But that's, that's BS, by the way. No, he told, I know exactly what he told me. The point is, we knew that they weren't who they said they were. And David Koresh and Steve Schneider, well, no, Steve Schneider and Wayne Martin were, Wayne Martin was the Harvard educated attorney that lived there on the property and was a firm believer in David and had a law practice in town. So Wayne was very worried about this. And David said, it doesn't matter who they are, CIA, FBI, ATF, I don't care. I here to present a truth. I'm going to present that truth. Maybe I can show Robert some things and he'll be able to hold back the forces for a little longer because David believed that he was going to be attacked. He's, he believed that ever since he first started seeing the scripture. When he would read the scripture, he would see himself in alignment with God and that the king of the north, or if you will, the powers of Babylon, the powers that be would fight against him because 
he was on the side of God and he, he didn't know at the time that he would have the truth, but he always believed he would be on the side of God and would be fought against. So when he got the truth and he claims in a vision that the seven seals were given to him, then he started really teaching it when he went to Israel. And when he came back, a lot of the old people said he was a different person. And to me, that's another thing that's incredibly fascinating about his story. He, he like changed from this trip. He became a different person. He became someone that people, you know, would talk to about getting their car fixed, but they wouldn't rely on him from scripture because he was, you know, a bit radical, a bit wacky, stuttered to someone who could go on to command the group and teach it. So it was very interesting hearing their stories about the transformation of Vernon to David Koresh. I'm actually trying to get a documentary done. I want it to be a series. And one of the things I'm going to focus on, because I find it so fascinating, is that transition from Vernon to David Koresh, because there was a transition there. So anyway, on February 28th, the day after a six-part series in the Waco Tribune Herald called The Sinful Messiah came out, the BATF attacked. They had two cattle. Anybody see, did you all see the series, the six-part series? Okay. Well, then, you know, the cattle trailers came down. For those of you who didn't, two cattle trailers came down where there were helicopters in the back of the building. Uh, people uh, like Kevin uh, Whitecliffe, who was at the back of the building, claimed that the first shots were from the helicopters and that he watched the helicopters shooting into the building. Uh, people at the front all claimed that the first shots were the, for, from the agents at the front door, possibly from the agents shooting the dogs first. And that's what started the whole thing off. <clears throat> no matter how you look at it, there's 25, 30 kids in that building. David Kresh has worked with Robert Rodriguez on a daily basis. They knew who he was. The ATF claimed he never left. They couldn't get him jogging in front of their house because he never left the house. However, nine days before we have, uh, there's a document stating that two of the ATF agents went to a firing range with David Koresh and shot at a firing range. In other words, an agent shot a gun and handed it to the guy that they claimed they were scared of, David Koresh. Well, David Koresh fought this, shot the same gun at the firing range two miles away from Mount Carmel. So they were not afraid of him. He did come out. He was daily in contact with them. They could have gotten him any time and avoided all of this. All of this, to me, is like there's two trains on the same track. They're heading right for each other, and neither one's backing down. And that was the FBI, the ATF, the FBI, and David. Um, I believe that there were <clears throat> incredible mistakes made on both sides. I think there was incredible arrogance on both sides. More from the FBI side, uh, in my estimation, from being there than David's. But definitely, David was no, he was, he's not innocent in all this. And that's kind of one of the hardest things is there, there are certain survivors who expect me to be more on the David train, but I, I just can't do that because as a free thinking individual, I see all the mistakes that he made along the way and all the lives that were affected by him. But at the end of the day, he didn't gas the kids. The FBI gassed children, they gassed the kids. At the end of the day, FBI, uh, David Koresh did not go gunning for the ATF. They came in gunning for him, us, and the children. And the people at the front door, after they were shot at and saw Perry Jones go down screaming, started to shoot back and defend their house. And frankly, I have no qualms with that whatsoever. I am sorry, I do not apologize for that at all. You come to a Texas farmhouse with kids and you start shooting, you're gonna get what you deserve. Okay, that's good. I, I'm done with my, I'll get off my soapbox. Can we open it up to questions? Because I don't want to miss the opportunity. And I, the story could go on and on. There's so much to the story. And I apologize for being brief or going over the place a little bit. But I wanted you guys to have more of an understanding of the scriptural foundation and why the people were there. And that if they weren't there, it's going to sound funny. They weren't there because of David, they were there because of God. They were there because of what the scripture says. David was the one showing them, but these were people that most of them had studied scripture all their life, and they were seeing it clearly for the first time is how they all looked at it. So there's a lot more, but maybe take a couple questions before I run out of time. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Thank you for setting the foundation of the draw, the appeal, the, the longing to be there to kind of push against all the the labels that people oftentimes will label those who join. So I, I wonder, do people have some questions? I know that for many of you who raised your hand or nodded your head, you saw the mini series, or at least those who are a little older know of it historically when it was happening. Um, what <clears throat> questions might you have for David today?
Well, I do have a question. When you're going I go through, on. <laughs> well, when you're going through this process, right? So when when the the initial you know invasion happens and kind of what's going through your personal mind when all this happens? Yeah, I was terrified. I was totally in shock. I figured I kept thinking they're going to come in and shoot me. They're going to come in and shoot me. We're we're done. <laughs> We're done. I didn't even see the cattle trailers. I didn't know the extent. All I know is shots were being fired everywhere. And living in Hollywood for the two years prior to that, when you hear shots, you duck under a car and you wait till it's over and you let the tourists look around to see where the shots are coming from. So I wasn't a tourist. I was on my face and I went to the middle of the house just hoping that, that, I, that, I, that I wouldn't be shot. So I waited yeah, I basically waited in the weight room, the room that we worked out in, until the firing had, had ceased, which was about 40 minutes later. Mm. So, I, yeah, I was beyond afraid. I mean, I had fired a gun in a firing range before, but I was not a gun enthusiast. I was not a... I never wanted to join the military, shave my head and live with men. Where do I sign? That was kind of my attitude. I just was not what I... That, that, that was not that kind of guy. So being in a situation like that was overwhelming. It was, it was, it was terrifying, but what was interesting, well, interesting is not the right word. Talking to everyone after is what was fascinating. That's not even the word is where that's where I learned what happened that day. Everyone at the front door had the same story. Koresh went to the door, he held his hand out. He said, hold on, there's women and children here. Let's talk about this. Boom, 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 shots hit the door. The door flies back in his hand from the velocity of the bullets hitting it. He falls back and that's when Terry, Perry Jones, his, well, Perry was the father of Rachel and Michelle, his, his first two wives. Uh, Perry went down screaming and that's when the people at the front door started shooting. So they had already started shooting. Kevin Whitecliffe, he came in and I said, boy, did you hear all those shots that were coming from the front? He goes, no, they started shooting at the back. I watched the helicopters come in shooting and he was screaming it. He was yelling. I myself personally went into a room where um, a guy named Winston Blake was staying and there was, well, this is, I was crawling down, I was crawling down the hallway and this water was coming out from under this um, door. It wasn't a door. We didn't have a door. The building was being completed still. There was a blanket over the door and I opened the blanket and the light, I went from dark to the light, the light came in and I couldn't see for a second. And I noticed the window was shattered and the, where Winston Blake's room was, there was a window and in front of the window was the outside. And uh, right in front of that window was a circular 500 gallon, gallon water tank that we had for water storage. And water was leaking in through a hole in the water tank into Winston Blake's room. And I followed the trajectory of the water down to this lump that was laying on the floor. And I just looked and as my eyes started to focus, I could see it was Winston in his jacket that he had this red jacket. His face was the other way. So I couldn't see his face, but there was a pool of blood mixing with the water. And I just knew he was dead. I didn't, he just wasn't moving. I knew he was dead. And I kind of just put the, I, 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 I put the door back, I put the, the blanket back and I tried to hold my breakfast in and I moved on. Now, later on, I went into that room after they cleaned his body out and I got on my knees and I followed the trajectory of the bullet. So as the water tank curves, right? The bullet had come in from one curve through the water and to the other side and down into where Winston's bunk was. And I could see getting on my knees from the trajectory of the bullet that it was fired from the air between the two towers. David Koresh's tower where his room was and the water tower to the left where Peter Gent was killed. First thing in the raid, the helicopters came by and shot him. He was on top of the water tower. He was he had been doing work on the water tower. He was cleaning it out. So there's no doubt in my mind the helicopters fired into the building. There's people, there are people online that to this day still deny that. Um, when you see uh, YouTube, there's one guy in particular, he does top 10 lists. He says the helicopters never fired into the building. That, that is not true. All of the survivors, even the two attorneys, Dick DeGuerin and Jack Zimmerman, who came in during the siege, 
um, saw the evidence of the of bullet holes in the roof from where helicopters were firing from the outside in. And I said, to, I said, Dick, is there any way that those bullet holes were shot from the inside out? And he said, well, not really, because I, I know what an exit wound looks like. And I know that when sheetrock is dangling like this, it's usually because someone is firing from the outside in. I said, that's a very good point, Dick. Thank you very much. I said this. I was doing a, at the time I was doing a podcast series, which never came out. So anyway, you know, I, that's one thing I try to tell people that if the helicopters were firing, it's an incredibly illegal move. Uh, helicopters, military equipment is not supposed to be used against American citizens. And certainly they're not supposed to be firing against American citizens, at least back then. I don't know what, what the law is now, but that would have made their very raid incredibly illegal, which we know it to be. The front door disappeared when it was asked at, at one of, it was at, uh, when we had the civil case and the criminal case, they were asked for where the door, the two metal doors were, the one that David Crush had in his hand. The other door was entered into evidence, a metal door that had a few bullet holes in it. But the, the door that had all the bullet holes coming from the outside in had disappeared. So when they were asked where that door was, they said, oh, it must have disintegrated in the fire. Yet its sister door was entered into evidence. The early stages of the raid were recorded by the ATF and people on the ground. They had three videotapes, three cameramen. Two of the tapes disappeared and the third tape malfunctioned. So there's no videotape of the early stages of the raid. Okay. To me, it's the lack of evidence that really concludes for me what actually happened that first day. They wanted you to think that the Davidians waited for them, the government to come and that it was a full open ambush. That is not true. And I, and I will also say this, if it was an ambush, how come Wayne Martin was on the phone dialing for 911 to call this off right away after the first shot, Wayne Martin was dialing 911, telling them to call it off. And it still took 40 minutes to coordinate on the ground with the ATF guys because they didn't have any communications with the sheriff's department. So the ATF did an incredibly poor job of planning this thing could have all been avoided by picking David up or even talking to David. He was, he talked to Robert every day. So I don't forgive them for that. I don't forgive the people on the ground who, when they know they lost, they lost the element of surprise. They went forward with a raid anyway, instead of calling it off. It was just mistake after mistake after mistake. Well, I really appreciate that. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and uh, one question about the actual kind of your experience and how it was how it was shown on the miniseries. Um, the question is this: uh, There's a scene in the TV series where you leave the compound to bury a member of the Davidians. Uh, is that accurate? And if so, how did you have the courage to do that? Sure. What was going through your head? Yeah, um, that was accurate, but it wasn't me. <laughs> one of the things that they did is they had there was 130 people in that building. So a lot of the stories had to be told through five or six characters, seven or eight characters that were introduced. So they had me doing a lot of things that other people did, which I feel bad about, but there was nothing I could do about it. And what I tell people is, listen, I wrote a book about it. The series was made partially from my book. My book is what my actual experience, what actually was the truth. In other words, I don't, I don't feel like I, I have not lied through any of this, but I can't help what a film producer does to change what really happened. What really happened was a guy named Greg Summers, a very good friend of mine, went and buried Peter Gent out in front of the building early on. And then he buried Peter Gent, who was killed in the water tower, and he put a cross up. And then he took the dogs. He had watched the dogs, Fawn and the five Alaskan Malmutes. And he put their bodies in a row so the cameras could see the bodies of the dogs and let people know that they came in shooting and killing the dogs first thing. So what happened is as the siege wore on, as the dogs' bodies disintegrated, the tanks became more aggressive and they started to run over Peter Jen's grave. And we would call and complain about that. And they'd be like, all they would ever say is we can't help what the tactical commanders do. So we're sorry about that, but they're going to do it. Boys with their toys are going to do what they're going to do. And they chose to run over Peter Jen's grade over and over and over again. They did everything to try to irk us. I think personally, they wanted us to shoot at them. So then they could say in the press conference, we're shooting at them and then they could take whatever action they wanted to. Um, 
but nobody, none of the none of the people inside fired a shot after February twenty eighth mm-hmm. at the F, at the FBI or the or the or the ATF. Okay, so the question they tried to get us to though. So when it comes to your experiences now, you know, a couple other questions. Uh, some people would ask about, um, you know, the mistakes that were made. You said mistakes on both sides. If you could speak to maybe mistakes you think that maybe uh, David Koresh made. Another person asked, did, did David Koresh circle himself with the women and children? Did he put them in harm's way? Well, the women and children, that's the last one first, the women and children were put, they were supposed to go to the underground bus, but what most people don't know is when the tanks started to go through the building on the last day, they cut off every avenue of escape to that bus. They put huge holes in the building, right in the front of the building. One of the tanks went through directly in front of where the concrete structure was. That's where the women and kids were put because the concrete structure, which was our walk-in cooler, had survived a fire in the 50s. It was the only thing that survived that fire. When they couldn't get to the underground bus, which is where they would have been the safest, even though the FBI said they gassed the bus as well, they couldn't get there because when the tanks had gone through the building, they tore, they tore the wall where the entrance way to the bus was. So there was debris. Nobody could get there. That's what, that's what um, I could see by the pictures. But then the tank went all the way through the building to where the concrete structure was and, st- and gassed the kids they guessed where all the kids were and they did that basically all morning they said why don't people come out well when you see a tank come through your house you don't go out that hole i saw a tank come through the front door i went back into to the building there was no way i was going out i i knew if i was to go out they would shoot me that's what i believed that's what everyone believed we believe we were going to be shot if we exited that building so nobody wanted to go out of there. So anyway, uh, the, the point is the kids were supposed to be put un- underground. They, they, they couldn't, they, the tanks destroyed the avenue, the only avenue there. So they were put in the safest place they could have been put at, but then the tanks decided to go all the way there and gas the children. What do you, how do you gas the children? How do you gas kids? Do you know that CS gas is banned? under the Geneva Convention. It's a, even the manufacturer of CS gas says it's a riot control agent only to be used outdoors, never indoors. They used 500 and something ferret rounds. They ran out of ferret rounds and then they had to take the tanks and take these giant barrels and pull, pull the tanks into the building and then shoot the CS gas throughout the building. The CS gas inhabited everything, the clothing, it destroyed the, the, the woodwork. When you see the fire burning, if you watch the early stages of the fire burning on, on the last day on April 19th, it's black. It's pitch black, the fire. It's pitch black because it's a chemical fire. That's the CS gas burning off, which when it burns off, it is a cyanide poisoning. Another reason it's not supposed to be used indoors. Yet the FBI felt in their wisdom that this was the sea ga- that, that this was the tear gas to use in Mount Carmel. It's criminal. The amount of CS gas they used, using it indoors, all these things are criminal acts. But they're 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 nothing, they're nothing's ever gonna come from it. And let's not even mention the FLIR video. Now the FLIR video is the infrared video. The government had a plane flying above Mount Carmel, two miles above. This is the FBI plane, my friends, not the Davidian plane. And on that plane, they had infrared technology. Infrared technology shows heat signatures, okay? On these, on these infrared videos, we have two explosions at the back of the building, which is the, the, the shed, not the shed, uh, the gym. The gymnasium area was brought to the ground. The tanks went in and literally brought that gym to the ground. All these pictures, by the way, are on my website, uh, wacosurvivors.com, if you want to check it out. A lot of amazing pictures there. Sorry, I don't have a presentation of pictures today. But the gym was collapsed. We have two explosions in one of the windows of the gym right before the fire begins in one of the areas where the fire begins. Two, the explosions are so bright that from two miles up, the cameraman focuses in on those the, the two explosions. And then as the fire is beginning, it begins in three different places, <clears throat> we see tanks at the back of the building. Next to the tanks, we see fully automatic weapons, these bright flashes. There's about 68 if you count them all. <clears throat> so there's fully automatic weapons being fired near the tank positions into the back of the building. I talk about this over and over and over again. No one will touch this with a 10-foot pole. You've never seen it on NBC or CBS. You've never. The only place you've ever seen this tape is in a documentary called Waco, The Rules of Engagement, which was nominated for an Oscar 
that was a phenomenal piece of work, a phenomenal documentary, yet most people don't even know it exists. They never talk about the flare tape, and if they do, they discredited the flare tape by saying, those aren't fully automatic weapons fire, those are sunlight reflections. That's what the government says. Hmm. On an infrared tape that only shows heat signatures. So my question is, how can they possibly be sunlight reflections? They can't be sunlight reflections. And frankly, a 13-year-old who was raised in a gun culture can tell you that those aren't sunlight reflections. But who wants to believe that the American government shot and killed people trying to exit the back of that building? Do you? Does anyone? In it? Nobody wants to believe that. So even though it's the most incredible piece of information, piece of truth I've ever seen, no one will touch it. Very disheartening. It's been a tough 27 years trying to talk about the infrared and no one cares. And frankly, on the left, no one cares because it was a religious group with firearms. It was guns and God, two things the left hates. So they didn't care. Oh, plus they were in control too. They were in power at the time. Oh, and just to say, guys, by the way, I, I'm not I'm I'm not a Republican or a Democrat anymore. I, you know, I I believe in the country and the foundations of the country, but we are way, way off track. And I think we have been for a very long time. I find it very bothersome that we're, well, that we're close to civil war over politics. It, that begs a question. I really appreciate you sharing. We kind of wrap up because I know we're almost at time. Uh, but there's a couple questions about like how all this has impacted you now. And I know we can't get to all of that because this has been 27 years of, of journeying for you. But when you think about your own sense of like religious practice or organized religion and or um you know, how, how do you proceed? How have you proceeded since this with any kind of engagement of of religion um, in in life? Boy, that is a complicated question, my friend. <laughs> I just read everything I can. I want to know if there is a new historical finding in Israel. I want to know what it is. Apparently, in Egypt, they just found uh, on my birthday, February thirteenth they found a, a brewery, the oldest brewery known to man. <laughs> so, you know, I, if there's a new archeological dig, I wanna know, I wanna know the truth. I wanna know what's going on. I wanna know what scripture is real, what scripture is inspired, what scripture was made by man. And it's a quest that's gonna take my whole life and I'm never gonna have the answers, I don't think. But I think to me that that is the search for the Holy Grail. It's not in finding the Grail, it's in searching for it. That's where your enlightenment comes from. So I think, you know, that we are supposed to search for the truth. We are supposed to search and wonder what it's all about. Where do we go after this? I would like to say, uh, I think my face complicated. Uh, I spent a lot of time doubting these days. I spent a lot of time listening to the other side. I spent a lot of time listening to the other side. So by the other side, I mean uh, using... Uh, atheist reasoning, if you will. But I've just seen something that is deeper than that. I've seen, I just, I have seen, I have seen too much to, to, I could never believe that there isn't a God, that there isn't a force out there watching us and shaping our lives every day that we are even unaware of what's happening behind the scenes. I, I feel it. It's, it's there. When I first went to Mount Carmel, I started to get what they call sleep paralysis, which I never had in my life. And there's no sleep about it. I was wide awake and being pinned down to my bed to the point where I couldn't talk. I couldn't, all I could do was think. And for about 30 seconds, and then it finally let me up. That happened to me on several occasions right after I met David and coming to Mount Carmel. It happened to all the young men at Mount Carmel. Just about all of them had spiritual pin downs. I call them spiritual pin downs. I don't call them sleep paralysis. So, you know, at this point, I don't care who believes me or what. I'm, you know, I, I have been very truthful in my book about Mount Carmel and about David. Uh, embarrassingly truthful, actually. Very <laughs> embarrassingly truthful. But it's just what it was. It, it's 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 what happened. It's the truth. The truth. I have a saying. I write whenever somebody gets a book through my website. I sign it personally, and the saying I write in there is: "The truth will set you free, and the free shall seek the truth." And there it is. I'm going to spend my life seeking the truth. I personally am working on a documentary. I'm trying to get 
someone that was behind that building that day to sit down and and tell me the truth and say, yeah, we, we shot at people trying to escape. Or I would even accept people inside were shooting at our tanks, so we were shooting back at them. The point is, it's not a mass suicide if even one person tried to exit that building and was shot down by the government. It's a homicide. And even the coroners that were responsible for taking all the bodies and putting them in the body bags said publicly they did not believe this was a mass suicide. This looked more like a homicide to them. So everyone at the time thought that was people inside shooting each other. But when you see the infrared, you see a, definitely a more sinister side. And, you know, Mike include even in the series, I said, how are you guys going to deal with the infrared? And they didn't show a shooter. But if you remember, they showed people running through the gym and then going down. You hear a boom, and then they went down. So that's how they dealt with it in the series, which I'm thankful. I'm thankful that at least they put that in because I knew that they couldn't show a shooter shooting people trying to I knew that that wasn't going to happen, even if the truth shows that that was, that's not going to happen in a, in, in a, in a show, in a six part series. I can't believe they put in what they did, frankly, because they put so many truths into that. So like when I say that I, I wasn't the person that buried the person in the front, it was Greg Summers. Somebody buried a body in the front, but it wasn't Perry Jones. It wasn't me that buried it. Perry Jones was buried downstairs in the, in the mud shelter, okay? Um, like I said, I wrote the book 20 years before the show came out. The book is what really happened to me. The book is the truth. And the show didn't overtly lie. It's just, like I said, it was, uh, they had to, character condensated they had to put a bunch of characters together in one it's the only way they could do a show like that so i forgive them <laughs> well this has been so fascinating i know there's so much more that could be shared we are at our time but uh, i mean, know that every time you share this story that you're sharing a personal part of who you are and i, I don't uh, underestimate just the value in that gift of, of you sharing your personal insight um, and your desire for continuing to seek the truth, right? That passionate to know that it's there. So again, thank you so much for your time. I know we've really enjoyed it. And you know, as David said, please search out his website um, for further questions for the book. Um, please, please go visit that and uh, join us next week at 11 o'clock. Thank you, David, so much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate okay. it. Have a good day. You too. Bye.